to the session on labs and incubators for the rest of us. Um, really excited to be on this panel with um, my fellow panelists here. Uh, we have uh, the director of uh, New Inc. in uh, New York, Julia Kagniski. We have Seb Chan, who you probably just heard <laughs> speak, and he's going to talk some more because he loves to chat. <laughs> Seb's over back me. And who is actually heading up the new Mahuki lab here at Te Papa. So we're just going to have a, um, a bit of an introduction uh, from each of them about their lab and what they've been doing and then we're going to move into sort of a conversation um, session and then we'll leave some time for questions at the end. So I'm going to actually hand over to Seb. Do you want me to do your slides? Oh, no, it's all right. You want to do your slides? Yeah, I'll do this. It's all right. Is it going to work? Yeah, okay. So, um, I think I've got video first, don't, don't, don't I? Okay. Yeah, let's see how this goes, eh? Yeah, that's the museum part, um, which is interesting because we're in the centre of uh, Melbourne and in fact, um, I guess I should rewind a bit and I guess Paula and I were talk, talk, talking initially about um, uh, may, may, maybe I wouldn't just focus on this, which is the uh, museum I'm at now, but also this sort of sense of labs also being things that don't actually exist like at Cooper Hewitt so we might get to that bit later on in eh? yeah. discussion so that's why I'm now big museum in the center of uh, Melbourne as I said in the previous talk Nas Na National Museum of all of these things so why would it set up a co uh, co-working space well this is this is why and when our new CEO came came in um, the mission slightly tweaked and the mission now is about building a connection with the sector we rep we represent and draw materials from and work with as well as the public so the public has sort of there's the professional public which isn't researchers and scholars but actually makers and doers filmmakers game makers those sorts of people um, so this is Ac 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 and Katrina too who's our CEO is a bold new co-working space that sits alongside the staff of the Australian Centre for the Moving Image. When you join ACMEX, you're going to be part of a community from filmmakers to games developers to app developers to people working with virtual reality. It's about having a daily conversation with the creative industries whose work we celebrate at its end. We want to be part of the journey. We're going to run an industry events program so that experts from right across these industries can talk about things that they've learnt ways of working, opportunities and challenges. Most importantly, ACMEX is about making connections between ideas and industry and building community that really is going to support the growth of creative industries in this state. So we've been open for uh, about seven months now and most of our tenants are now on six, six month plus leases. Uh, we have two of the ma major uni universities in Melbourne also have desks there, which they're po 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 post grads and some some, ac some academics use. And what's interesting about our space is that it is not walled off from the rest of the museum staff. In moving to the new offices of, that we have that houses this uh, space, there are only three staff with rooms. Everybody else is in the open to plan air, uh, um, the open plan space. So the people with the off the off the, the offices, of course, the CEO Katrina, the CFO, and the HR manager. Everybody else works alongside the co-workers, which is really about that con that that conversation piece. So a bunch of uh, companies, uh, artist-run initiatives, and artists. Um, uh, we have uh, sev sev several VR VR companies based in there. We have a YouTube multi-channel net network called Val Valley Arm, who brings in. You, 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 YouTube celebrities to use the meeting rooms and stuff every now and again. There's lots of stuff going on. We all share a big 
uh, communal kitchen. Um, it's that kind of thing. So it's actually about bringing the museum staff and makers and creators closer to, 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 together. And I think that's perhaps the differentiator is that we are actually very phys phys physically co-located with the staff. But that's probably enough from me, right? Yeah, we'll move along. So, yeah. do we? Oh, okay. Mine was, mine was gonna be a little bit longer. But, um, so I'm Tui, I'm the general manager of Mohiki to Papa's Innovation Hub. So uh, in the next uh, three or four minutes, I just want to give you a quick overview of what Mahuki is. This is the movie trailer version. To get the full version, you've got to sign up for the movie. So it all starts with, actually, uh, Mahuki is an innovation program, and at heart, what is innovation? It's about actually trying new things. Uh, but Mahuki is, is two core parts to it. There is the accelerator program, and I'm going to talk a little bit in detail about that. Uh, which is where Mahuki or Te Papa is working in partnerships with uh, businesses. The second part, which is uh, just as important, is the outreach program, which is a series of other activities that work around the um, accelerator program to help um, bring innovation, ideas, and perspectives and people into Te Papa. So we set up the uh, the very first accelerator program started in August with ten teams. We set out put out a list of. 12 challenges out to the, um, the community and, and ask them to come up with ideas or solutions for those. We, um, so we went out to businesses and teams and what we'd ask them to do is actually, uh, we are interested in both experience and enterprise solutions. So uh, solutions that are going to help us enrich the stories that we tell and also ideas that are going to help us run our businesses better. We're part of a growing movement, uh, so a trend amongst uh, museums and other culture institutions to partner with industry, businesses, with artists, or with um, entrepreneurs in order to fast track innovation and to strengthen what we do. And um, while there are lots of different types of uh, innovation labs or whatnot around, Mahuki is, is a particular type, so, um, which is we've, we've taken quite a commercial or business approach. In terms of the basics, uh, we will run one program a year. As I said, the first program kicked off in August and uh, the teams are downstairs and they'll finish up in December. And during that time, uh, I guess that's a short duration co-working model. They're based uh, on site with the Papa staff, not immediately adjacent like ACMI as, as your one, but they're still based on site and get to interact with the Papa staff. We provide funding to the teams of $20,000 in order for them to participate. That's really important because a number of teams just wouldn't be able to participate and then we'd get one certain type of demographic that could and we want this to be as diverse as possible. Uh, we t are taking equity in the businesses of 6%. So hopefully some of these businesses go on to achieve great things and we will have, uh, we are invested in their success and that also could return um, uh, some sort of reward back to Tupapa in the future. And as I said before, we're, it's really important that we had a diversity of teams. So uh, six of the ten teams have a female co-founder and three of the teams are uh, CEOs are female. We have a Māori team. We have uh, teams that we can, we can in Mahi at the moment, there's six different languages. Pidgin, Russian, French, Māori, Chinese. <laughs> we have a Chinese international student team as well. I think that my slides are going all over the place. <laughs> Sorry about that. Anyway, so in terms of the teams that we took in, these are the areas that they're um, working in. Analytics, wayfinding, uh, VR, gaming, learning innovation. Uh, a quick um, shout out for you guys is that one of our teams, Dot Dot, is uh, setting up a trial down in Story Place on level two. Right now, if um, you would like to go down after this and experience their VR solution, you can have a go. And here they are. And I have two of the teams are in the, the room at the moment, Curio and um, Open Window. So the second part of the Mahuki is the outreach. So, and there's two parts to this. One is working with tertiary um, institutions and the second part is working with the general startup community. So we have, alongside uh, setting up and running the first Mahuki program, been really active at working with tertiary institutions, mainly in Wellington, but also throughout New Zealand. And this is really important and critical to us. It's been a lot of work, 
But the advantage of, the, of this is that we've been working with student teams, also issuing, issuing out our challenges, also getting their fresh ideas and perspectives into the way uh, innovation that the public could deploy. These are just some of the ones that we are, um, have already completed and we have another six underway. And then the second part of that is just general outreach. So as I said, the hub will only run once a year, it runs in the second half of the year, but when the hub is not operating, we have a venue space downstairs and we're already planning for smaller mini mahiki innovation programs. And the ones we have in the works at the moment, one is a, is a sh short duration workshop with the Pacific Business Trust, working with Pacifica businesses to help um, tell richer stories and um, solutions around our Pacific collection. Um, we're also looking at a partnership with um, the local VR and AR Association. By the numbers, so 37 entrepreneurs, 10 teams, uh, 26 tertiary interns alongside the paid interns that we have on board. I won't read all of those out, but what they speak to is that Mahuki is impacting a much greater ecosystem than just the teams that come into the program, and that's also really important. And this, as some of you will know, is Connected Worlds at New York Call of Science. And I put through this up to, to demonstrate this. Uh, this is all about the ecosystem and growing you know, exponentially out the impact. So all of those people that Mahuki program is also touching on are also helping to, um, to they are learning about Te Papa and the sector's needs and challenges. They are getting actively involved and we're increasing their understanding. So why an innovation accelerator? Firstly, the first one is pretty obvious, but we want to innovate. We, we want to try new things. And uh, this is one of a number of models we could have employed, but for us it's been a really good model. It's a way of bringing in fresh external perspectives um, for actually what is a pretty reasonable investment to help us um, generate new ideas. Uh, remain relevant in an increasingly digital world. So actually the speed of change is happening so quickly, it's really important that, uh, from Te Papa's point of view, that we were staying abreast of ideas and partnering with, uh, through the Accelerator program as a way that we can do this, is to stay um, at the leading edge, um, uh, yeah, saying that double, but you know what I'm saying, much more quicker. <laughs> much more quicker. <laughs> Unleash a national asset. So one of the things also is taking a fresh look at Te Papa. We are New Zealand's national museum and actually uh, alongside all of the other things that we do, we also have the opportunity to contribute to our nation's prosperity. Just that small goal. So actually Te Papa has an international brand, we have uh, fantastic international connections and pathways to market, so actually the, it's another way of looking at the museum to actually unleash those um, in support of our, of our nations. Um, Vibrant digital dimension to the renewal program, as you know, Te Papa is about to go through the most dramatic changes over the, uh, since its inception. Over the next five years, every permanent exhibition will be switched out. And then this last bit is increasing um, the capability, our capability by increasing the capability and understanding of the people that we work with. That's it. Thanks, Joe. All right, spoiler alert, I'm giving a keynote after this um, <laughs> on very much the same things, uh, but I am here from New York. I run New Inc., uh, the New Museum's Incubator for Art, Design, and Technology. Uh, we just started our third session, um, and uh, we're located in the building next door to the museum. Uh, we occupy 8,000 square feet. Um, there with uh, about 60 desks um, and we have a community of about a hundred creative practitioners um, some of them are individual artists some of them are studios um, working in say design or mobile and web development um, essentially doing client services style work uh, some of them are startups developing digital or physical products and uh, some of them are also nonprofits um, uh, we also have two anchor tenants, um, Columbia University's uh, Graduate School of Architecture Planning and Preservation runs uh, a program out of our space for postgraduates where they select about 20 um, graduates uh, of that program who are starting new businesses. And uh, the other anchor tenant is Rhizome, which is a long-standing affiliate of the museum. It's a digital arts organization that um, focuses on uh, contemporary art made uh, online, um, but also digital preservation. Um, so this is kind of the, the ecosystem that we were looking at of 
um, spaces that existed um, and that we wanted to create something that filled the gaps in between them. Obviously as a museum we're kind of most familiar with artist residencies and how they serve to develop um, art uh, artists and, and their practice. Um, we also saw co-working spaces proliferating around the city um, and tech incubators as well. And it seemed like every industry had an incubator except for the arts. Um, so that was one gap that we saw happening. And uh, we were also, I think, very much inspired by university media labs, places like MIT Media Lab, uh, NYU's ITP program that are working in a very uh, interdisciplinary, or as MIT likes to call it, anti-disciplinary fashion, uh, bringing together different modes of practice under one roof and, and trying to foster collaboration between them. And so we kind of drew inspiration from all of these different uh, programs to try and create something new that would fill in uh, this gap that we saw happening um, for um, creative practitioners who were working in ways that were more entrepreneurial than could be served by a typical artist residency, but often too creative, too small, um, not necessarily focused on rapid scale and acceleration that most tech incubators required, um, because many of them do take equity and an investment, and so they're looking for businesses that can grow quite large so that they can recoup that return on investment. And so we're, in a way, um, kind of more focused on small businesses and startups, and I would argue that artists are also small businesses. Um, and, um, you know, Seb talked a little bit about the financial climate um, as it relates to the arts in his fireside chat. Many of you are probably familiar with it. Um, we're definitely a much more private philanthropy focused uh, country than, um, you know, government funding. Um, and, um, this is not to make a case that one is better than the other, but just so you have a sense, the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, this is from 2012, was about half of what Kickstarter crowdfunding uh, contributed. And, uh, you know, I believe government funding is incredibly important and I wish there was more of it, but the reality is that there isn't. Um, and so we end up kind of having this very sort of enterprising way of having to fill in the gaps. Um, and having to figure out how to uh, get the resources that you need in order to make the work that you want to make and that you feel like should exist in the world. Um, and what that leads to is um, not only uh, having to get creative about how you access funding, um, but then also understanding the uh, administrative side, the logistical side, the financial legal side of what it actually takes to um, produce the work uh, once you've secured the funding. Um, because uh, in the case of, say, Kickstarter projects, maybe you've raised a couple of tens of thousands or even hundred thousand if you're lucky. Um, but now you have a community <coughs> of hundreds of backers who uh, are constantly asking you where uh, the project is that they've invested in. Um, and uh, many Kickstarter projects actually end up failing. So there was this whole kind of ecosystem that we saw evolving around us that we wanted to kind of help address and contribute to. Um, the other thing that is really interesting in New York is um, New York graduates more art and design graduates than any other U.S. city. Um, it, when surveyed uh, in, I think, 2014 uh, by the Center for an Urban Future, 88% of them said they wanted to stay and build their careers and their businesses and their futures in New York, but an overwhelming number of them did not have the business and entrepreneurial skills in order to do so. And as I mentioned, these skills are increasingly vital everywhere, but especially vital in the States. Um, this is our space. Um, our community uh, is with us for 12 months. The program is uh, 12 months. Um, so uh, we take teams as large as four. Uh, many of them are teams of two. Some are individuals. Um, they're uh, kind of all across disciplines, ranging from visual arts, performance, music, uh, architecture, uh, fashion, product design. Um, they are... Uh, there to the kind of develop uh, their business skills, essentially. So we run a professional development program uh, where we offer workshops and lunch lectures and classes um, that can help these creative practitioners understand how to build 
the initiatives that they want to build. Um, and this is just kind of a snapshot of some of our members. Um, we take 40 full-time and 40 part-time members every year, um, and they have the option to renew for a second year. Um, so it's a much kind of a longer t time frame uh, than uh, uh, Mahuki. And uh, we also do not uh, provide funding. Uh, we uh, charge monthly membership fees, uh, 600 a month for full-time, 350 a month for part-time. So in a way, uh, it's kind of similar to what Acme is doing uh, in a kind of co-working style model uh, where people pay for desk space. Um, however, uh, since launching, uh, we've uh, been fundraising to provide financial aid and scholarships to make it much more affordable and accessible um, to those who may not otherwise have the means. Um, Thanks, Julia. Um, so I, I run a very different lab in um, Sydney. It's called the DX Lab and it's uh, positioned in the State Library of New South Wales. Um, I don't run a physical kind of space like um, what these guys are doing with the co-working space and the artist run space. So it's something that we are looking for in the future, but at the moment we're a team that sits within the digital experience division of the State Library, uh, but we don't do any sort of business as usual digital products. Uh, we have a digital channels team who are running the website and doing other things. So what we're here to do for the library is um, push some of the boundaries around what a, a contemporary library can do and should be doing with its data. Um, we're really fortunate if, at the State Library that we have actually digitised about 10 million of our objects at the moment, so we, I've got this rich kind of data set that we can be working with to kind of push some of those boundaries with the technologies to make these collections more accessible um, uh, and, and sort of to inspire others to kind of use our data as well. Um, so we're sort of working in that digital humanities research more than a, um, a space that uh, develops um, that kind of incubator uh, program. But having said that, I still believe in bringing in people to benefit from the work that the lab um, has been fortunate enough to kind of be funded to do. So we do fellowships, we do scholarships, we do um, digital drop-in programs. We partner with a lot of different people. Um, so I think it's really important for us to have that space within the lab so it's not just us within uh, the library um, saying, hey, we can do this. It's about bringing the people in with us to kind of look at things in a new way um, and kind of challenge some of the perceptions around uh, collections and access because, you know, a lot of the ways you get <laughs> to material is not kind of uh, easy. Um, and we're sort of pushing some of those boundaries around the one-to-one -one relationship with search as well. Uh, so that's, we put out a fellowship this year, it was $30,000. I think it was one of the first dedicated digital fellowships offered by GLAM. Um, and that's really important to us in the library. We do a lot of research um, and fellowships. Uh, but one, when I got there, I noticed that there wasn't sort of a dedicated digital kind of experimental fellowship, so we were lucky enough to be um, supported by the foundation to, to do this. And the, we've got a couple of creatives who have taken that up, and they're doing a really incredible job with um, exposing some of the collections in new ways. Um, had two digital drop-ins. In fact, we had Chris McDowell from um, New Zealand here come over and do a drop-in with us for about a week and we kind of rapidly prototyped um, a product called Weemala, which is looking at indigenous place names in Australia. Um, that's been quite successful for us and so we've gone on to now look at maybe doing version two of that. And Loom is just an a, a example of a big data biz project that we've just pushed out this year, um, looking at data from the Sydney area, but um, having three different lenses uh, an experience of getting into the same data. So um, that's all on our website under experiments. Um, let's just actually go, we'll leave it on that. Um, so now we're just going to kick off into um, a bit more sort of informal discussion. Um, I think you get a sense from all of us how different our, um, our labs are. And um, 
I want to pick up on something that actually you, Courtney, and Seb were talking about in terms of the relevance of the work that we're doing in labs and experimentation hubs, co-working spaces in the creative cultural sector right now. Why are they important? What is what is sort of um, the reason that you know we have to do this work now, and how do we make them sustainable? So I might I might start with you, Julia, on that. If that's okay. Um, sure. Uh, why is it important? Um, I think. From our perspective, uh, we really look at the uh, creative ecosystem, the creative industries, the creative economy. And uh, I think during your conversation, Seb, the idea of the museum as public servant came up, which is very familiar to us. But um, I think it's kind of extending uh, the role that the public servant can play in your local city and community and how we support uh, the creative industries more broadly, not just the artists who we show in our museum, um, but what uh, does the creative ecosystem of New York look like? Um, it is becoming an increasingly uh, difficult place to live uh, for artists. Um, it's prohibitively expensive um, and there isn't uh, you know, the wealth of support that you have uh, here and in Europe. And so how can we uh, play a role in that? Um, in terms of sustainability, um, as I mentioned, we do have a business model. It was part of our mandate uh, to be self-sustaining as a program so that it isn't a program that is um, exclusively reliant on uh, patronage or grant support. Um, we do have a revenue stream uh, via the membership fees. And the fees uh, for desk space are comparable to what uh, members might pay at another co-working space in Manhattan, um, but with the added benefit of the uh, programming, the mentorship support that we offer them. Um, right now, because we've been fundraising to be able to subsidize members, uh, the revenue that we get from membership fees comprises maybe about 60 to 70 percent of our operating budget, so it's uh, the majority, um, but then we have some foundation funding to be able to uh, create some new staff positions and also um, to give scholarships and subsidies to those who can't afford it to pay. But I think for us, ours, ours is revenue neutral or rev revenue positive based on the uh, tenants, the tenancy agreements. Um, it's also allowed us to align, and this is something I'd recommend for small, small to mediums, is that alignment with a new source of fun, fun, for funding. Much as Julia said, that sense of getting out of just being um, arts, and, arts and culture or cultural tourism as your fun, funding sources, but to look at what um, you offer back to the creative, the creative cities push that's going on in large, larger cities. Um, and the innovation agendas, particularly in Australia and New, New Zealand, that open up new pools of government support from places you might not have seen, as well as from pri 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 private sources too, who may not have given to the arts, but will, will give to um, things that uh, they are more, more familiar with. Um, I would tell also that, you know, for us it's been the un universities has been key and find being in a city that has universities based in the C CBD, that ability to work with, with the universities has removed some of the needs for us that you know, we, we, we might have thought we might have, might have had to have done, which were to build, build um, fab, fab labs or editing studios and those sorts of things, which in our case would have, would have been perhaps additional to the museum's own requirements, and then they wouldn't have necessarily been used. Um, so but by working with others who have the physical resources, the, the specialist physical resources that your tenants might um, need is often a good way to go. It reduces your, your capital investment. But ours, I would say, has been premised on an off-office relocation move, which opened up um, six, 60 additional seats of space that we didn't need for our staff, but we had to pay the rent on. So um, by sub sub subleasing those in alignment with our mission, we've been able to not only cover co cover the rent, but better deliver our new mission and all these other ben benef benefits that flow both uh, directions to the tenants as well as to us as well as the community. And I think it's that alignment that alignment 
of benefit that's critical in both our spaces is that it's about that shared shared value that is created by the artists and small businesses and uh, the museum working together that exceeds what would have been done individually. Uh, so you asked about speed and sustainability. So uh, firstly, thinking about speed, I mean, one of the um, Obviously it's called an accelerator, which means we're all about speed, and part of that is about that the startup philosophy of fast failing. So the idea is actually, um, or the philosophy is that to, to move quickly through ideas and test those ideas, and those that are going to fly continue with them, but those that aren't, fail it quickly so you can move on to the next idea. And so part of um, the ethos of programs like us are also about um, embracing and celebrating fast fails there is successful. So that, that speaks more to the program. But in terms of the accelerator, one of the outcomes of Mahuki has been that it has put a little bit of pressure onto Papa to speed up some of its activities, one of which is the digitization of, of our collection. Um, so, and I've been thinking about that, and um, I've spoken to some, uh, to some Māori audiences, and with, you know, as you will know, there's quite a lot of um, clearances and considerations around the use of Māori tonga and what not, but actually future generations of uh, New Zealanders, including Māori, are going to want to, to be able to see their stories or participate in the different and emerging um, technology platforms that are coming through. So, um, so, and this is one of the things we picked up from our trip to the US, is that actually will we as museums be there to meet those technology platforms when they're ready to be able to tell the stories in the formats that a number of our different audiences are going to demand of us in the future. So th those are kind of a few reflections on the speed side. I'm not sure if I actually answered the, exactly what you wanted, but anyway, <laughs> got those off my chest. Um, in terms of sustainability, uh, so, for program, so for general business accelerators, you generally ask for three years, give us three years in order to prove out the success and the outcomes of this program. And during that three years, also to um, to be working on a sustainability plan for the ongoing funding. So none of these programs should be set up expecting to be pay to be funded forever. They just won't be, um, no matter how successful you are, because at some t stage something more shiny and bright will come up, and it should. So actually, we're not planning for this to be around forever, but we're planning to give this a damn good go right now. Um, part of the sustainability plans for Mahuki is that uh, the space will be available for commercial hire when Mahuki is not running its program, which will also help underwrite. Um, and we're looking at a number of other different revenue streams. So just picking up on that um, point of success, which we talked a bit about yesterday, so what, what does success kind of look like for you in, in these spaces and how do you measure that and how do you like being so new, I mean, you're probably the oldest in a way because it's, it's three years now, yeah. coming up to three years. How, how do you measure success for um, the work that you do? Yeah, I mean, you know, of course there's the traditional sort of economic development metrics. So how many jobs were created? You know, what is the economic impact of uh, the businesses and the programs that are, uh, that are coming out of these spaces? Um, for us, uh, that's one aspect of it because not all of our um, members are interested in scalable projects. Um, looking at uh, kind of industry excellence, um, are the uh, companies and the individuals coming out of New Inc being recognized by their peers? Um, are they winning awards? Are they getting recognition? Um, what kind of collaborative environment are we creating? Are we seeing uh, these uh, entities and individuals at New Inc working together, uh, forging relationships, uh, hiring one another? Um, what sort of impact are we having on creating a generative space? Um, and for us to, I think because we are uh, probably the most kind of broad program of uh, these three um, in that we have both sole practitioners and um, startups that are you know seeking venture capital is um, having a, a dialogue 
between these typical polarities that are often very much siloed from one another and you don't um, often see an exchange in perspectives um, which can often be a critical exchange where artists are you know taking maybe an anti-capitalist stance and, and trying to problematize uh, the, the venture capital route um, and that's I think something that's really valuable um, and intangible and kind of hard to measure but it's something that we're uh, really interested in at least. Mm. So, so you've, you've kind of been involved in a number of different styles of labs. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about success across the different kind of Sure. I mean, platforms? for Ac Ac Acme X, our, our things are very similar to mm. Julia's in terms of success is reflected through the, the greater things that are made collab collaboratively. Um, over a longer period of time than maybe just their time with us. Um, but also that sort of alumni net, net, network, I think that universities have really, over the last de decade or so, have really n figured out how to maximise those alumni relationships. And that's a thing that I think co-working spaces and incubators in our se se sector need to really focus on, that we, our, we want someone who's been through one of our spaces in 10 years' time to say that's what changed their practice. Not to forget us, and it's when they're acquired by MoMA that they're like, oh, well, you know, I'm acquired by MoMA now, so great. Um, it's not that, it's that I'm acquired by MoMA, but I started out in New 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 Week. So being able to do that alumni piece. We actually just had a project that had their work acquired by MoMA. That's <laughs> just awesome. this past there you go. <laughs> so it happens. Um, but, but I think the other sort of, sort of labs is that the more labs that were labs by name, which was more akin to what Paul has got now, and I think you know when I was at Powerhouse, we had, we had a we had a team that was commercially funded. It was like a web agency inside the museum um, that was making pro projects for government at Coop, Cooper Hewitt. We called ourselves Coop, Coop, Cooper Hewitt Lab, but that was really only a naming device, and that naming device bought us a freedom externally which separated our brand from the broader museum brand and allowed our brand to push a different ris riskier view of the museum that then the museum brand incorporated, which was intentional, uh, but also allowed the, in the, in the in internal staff to see the work as happening in a safe space. And so that, that sort of naming um, of a lab even if it's not a phys physical space, or, if, um, or even if it's only your 20% time or 2% time as it is in our world. Um, it's that sort of naming that carves out a sort of a psych psychological fortress around your, your team that gives them permission to do things that they may not otherwise do, and allows other, um, um, other, um, um, others in the museum to say, that's okay, I don't have to see that as impacting on our core brand or impacting on my other work that has to happen. So it's that sort of safe space notion of carving out through naming, which is something, you know, we do with our identities, we do it with sub sub subcultures, we should do this with our work lives as well. So what's your advice though to um, uh, smaller organisations who don't have sort of even digital web teams, how, how would you um, suggest that they start working in that way, Seb, like just... Yeah, I mean, I think it is about creating that naming, you name a space first, and that creates it. The naming is important. Um, I, I would name a thing that doesn't exist to make, make that thing a reality, and humans are very good at doing that. Language is a very powerful tool that we often don't give enough credence to. Um, the other piece is that I think that um, it's about trying to... Um, small to mediums, you need to work, the lab is probably their piece with the community that they're part of and that they work with, and that the lab may actually be a psych, psych, psychological space that exists with that, with that community and scattered across a, a net, network of physical spaces in New Zealand that could be, a, or in Australia, it could be a series of sheds. We like sheds. <laughs> that sort of thing, but it could be that, that, that it could be, that there are moments where the lab emerges. Um, but it is about creating that safe uh, space through name, naming first. Okay, oh, so success for us is all of the things that those guys said. 
And um, but actually, the first success for us is that we just wanted people to apply to the program. Um, and they did, and we got 10 awesome teams. We want at least eight of them to finish the program, and that's looking that that's going to happen. And um, then we're looking at other more tangible results from the first program. We want to, uh, deployment into Papa, so we've got at least five of the teams looking at having active trials onto Papa or displays on the floor, um, including um, so Curio with um, Emily, uh, the VR display that I hope you'll go down and have a test of um, after this. Um, even point of sale um, and merchandise in the retail store to accompany the bugs exhibition. So those are really tangible outcomes. Long term, we want these businesses to really rock it and um, actually ultimate success from, from my point of view is that they will give us back some money. Um, and then there's all the, the other great things that, that go, around, go around that. We have an intervention from the floor. Um. <laughs> oh, you got a question? Um, I'm, I'm I'm just wondering for, uh, there's only so many kind of incubators that can exist in any kind of market, so to speak. I mean, here in Wellington, we've got a, you know, a bunch of them. I'm sure there's heaps in New York. Um, well, if maybe a few more. Um, what, what advice would you have to other organizations who don't have an incubator, um, who perhaps have got something to offer or want to get involved? There's, again, there's no point necessarily in us all setting up these incubators. Um, so, what are the ways which, you know, a, a, I guess a broader network uh, across uh, an environment can kind of connect into some of the things that, that you're doing? You have some hot tips prepared by Julia for this question. Um, um, so, that's a great question. I think one of the things that is probably true for all of us is that um, these initiatives that we set up um, were contributing to the community. They weren't competing with other programs that were already there. They were filling a gap, filling a need. And I think that's really important. That's point number two. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's true for both uh, Seb and I, and is it true for you as well, too? Uh, about the real estate piece that uh, you guys had, or did you develop that specifically? Uh, no, we okay, um, but you know the museum had a building uh, that we weren't using. Um, it we purchased it in two thousand eight because it became available. Uh, it came with some existing tenants, uh, and then you know one of the floors opened up, and so it was something that we had available to us, and we were um, thinking creatively about how we could utilize that space um, without uh, necessarily turning it into additional exhibition space. We were already doing artist residencies in that building, um, so you know, we could have expanded that, but this was uh, a way to launch a new type of program that was contributing something different to the community and to the ecosystem. Um, the community value add, I think, is the most important aspect. Um, so making sure that what you are offering is really uh, benefiting the, the whole in a unique way um, and, and doing something that isn't being done elsewhere. Um, strategic partnerships is also something that Seb talked about quite a bit. Um, as I mentioned, we work with Columbia University. Um, we also are developing uh, different kinds of strategic partnerships with other uh, cultural institutions, nonprofit spaces, education institutions. Um, for instance, we're uh, working with a um, uh, the, the Tribeca Film Festival, their interactive program, they often feed projects into our space because they grant them money um, and then those projects go off and, and are developed uh, somewhere independently, whereas at New Inc. they could be part of a community, they could have that uh, infrastructure and business training and support, um, and uh, it kind of makes Tribeca's investment uh, more secure in a way because y they're they're uh, developing it within an ecosystem where they have some sort of safety net, so to speak. Um, of course, having a business model, um, as Tui was mentioning, is really important for all of these programs because um, they are not funded in perpetuity. And uh, experimentation um, is something that I think is really important. So to your point, Andy, is. You know, what can you do that's small, that kind of tries it out um, and can test something, uh, iterate and evolve? Um, throughout 
new ink. We've been trying things, um, evaluating, assessing, and iterating, um, which is uh, that kind of lean startup methodology of like failing fast, um, but gaining insights about how we're doing what we're doing because it's new. Um, we're borrowing from different models, but not necessarily executing them 100% as prescribed in other kind of tech incubator or co-working environments um, because we're sort of adapting it for this particular cultural context. And so uh, if you can start small and, and you know, prototype something in your existing space, um, maybe you know bringing on a contractor to work in-house like as you were doing at powerhouse and seeing what happens with that uh that relationship and that exchange um and also kind of talking to the people in your community and seeing what do they need what can you provide that you uniquely have access to um that uh, is going to benefit them well i think it's also that that point of that what is the museum what has the museum got that's unique mm -hmm. and valuable to the community and making it Feel like what you're making has is is aligned with what the museum is about. I know we could all go and set up a commercial thing, but that would be kind of silly. Um, yeah. It has to align. It has to feel right. And I think museums, you know, we're not good at defining that some of the time. Right. right. And and the thing is, is that these creative uh, companies initiatives are often overlooked. Like they're not necessarily going to be hugely profitable in the way that venture capitalists uh, are interested in. And so they're underserved. Um, and how can we as cultural institutions help provide for them when no one else is? So, um, so just chucked up a few, this is from another presentation, just, just a few maybe handy hints of, of ways that you could start integrating or you know, start on the road, the journey towards integrating some of the, the philosophies underpinning the Mahiki program. But um, so the first one that everyone has talked a lot about the co-working. But the tertiary engagement, there's, um, some of you will be doing this already. But actually, the tertiary engagement is quite, um, you know, it's, it's a good solid foundation to the Mahiki program. There's nothing to stop any um, one doing that right now and actually giving live briefs out to students. It's a pretty low investment for actually a really high impact. Some of the the, the the ideas that we had back were phenomenal. And not only that, but it really inspired staff and got them thinking. And it put them into a, a mentorship leadership role. And so then it got them really um, interested because they were actually sharing their knowledge and information with the students. Uh, the outreach, so um, the innovation events that I talked about, uh, that's very easy to be run. Um, you can partner with others that will help you run those, but hackathons, startup weekends. We're looking at the potential um, for upcoming exhibitions. Uh, could we run some sort of startup weekend uh, in anticipation of those to get ideas from the startup community about what we might incorporate into some of those designs? The startup methodology, we've talked about that. So that's um, in Melissa and other members of the Papa Digital team have talked about the Agile, the Lean Canvas frameworks, but all of those are things that underpin Mahuki that can be introduced into organisations now. And then internship programs. So kind of glossed over that, but within Mahuki we have uh, four paid interns who sit alongside the program for its whole duration, but we have up to 26 unpaid interns, although some of them don't like, um, some people, do, you know, it would be great if we could pay them all, but we can't. But they're from the UB School of Design who provide uh, high technical skills into the teams, and that's another imp uh, community that we're <coughs> impacting. But that was, uh, but then the other one that I didn't have a slide for is actually um, in a number of organisations you have a commercialisation manager or you have someone that actually identifies. Um, innovation or activities within the organisation and then takes those out and looks to develop those a little bit further. That doesn't have to be a whole person, that could actually be a part of someone's job, but someone that's actually thinking about what is it, uh, so not necessarily new ideas like with, within Mahuki, but actually someone that's going around identifying what is it that we're doing in here that actually is really innovative and unique and we could develop that further into some sort of spin out or start up. So we might um, take some other questions, I think, now, because we've got about five minutes left. Do we have any other questions that you want to ask the panel? Just wait for the microphone and um, hold it up to your mouth. Hey, um, uh, so my, sorry, I did actually miss the first half, so sorry if this has been discussed, but um, my kind of question was like, which community are you targeting? Like, is there, do you worry about maybe just only reaching the 
a certain maybe privileged community of people who are already entrepreneurs who are already made it and what about the people who maybe haven't reached that for various like socio-economic reasons? Yeah, so we talked about that. You did. So with the Mahuki model, we provide funding to the teams that come into the program because um, it's been shown that, and we also provide funding to those four interns. It's been shown if you don't provide funding, you will just get a certain demographic in, uh, involved, and we didn't want that, so we wanted to have the, the most diverse group of companies that we could possibly choose from. But then all of the other activities, the tertiary outreach, the startup outreach, the internships, all of those are building the next generation of companies or teams that we hope will come into the program. Yeah, um, we've actually done quite a bit of legwork around uh, diversity and inclusion at New Inc. Um, in fact, uh, with the help of Grant, we were able to create a position specifically focused on this uh, this past year. And uh, what that position does is um, helps us look at um, different kinds of pipelines that can um, address uh, communities of color specifically, um, but also women um, and representation of different socioeconomic backgrounds in the space. Um, we have scholarships available for those folks, um, and it's something that we've looked at uh, pretty much from the get-go um, and have been developing um, resources to support and enable um, within our space. Yeah, we uh, curate our tenants and we take those issues into con consideration. We also have um, uh, supported places as well, but we take, by incorporating ACMEX into the mission of the museum, all our initiatives that cover it, we, we try to not separate those out. Um, and uh, so far, so good, touch wood. I think, you know, these are all museums as we're starting off these practices in the commercial space, we're trying to figure out how to make that work better. Um, and we have a lot of way, long way to go on it. Mm. I think being new at, you know, the DX Lab, we're sort of 15 months in, we're starting to realise, well, who are those people that can benefit from working within the DX Lab with us? And we notice there's when we start researching for, say, younger creative technologists, placements and things like that, there's not a lot around for uh, people who don't get opportunities, say, some in some of the regional areas. So we're looking at trying to um, offer a program for, you know, people who, who necessarily don't get those opportunities, and that could be through the digital drop-in program or through a fellowship. So I think, I think it's a really good question to be aware of. Do we have any more questions? Before we finish up, ah, one, one more. I've got one more. Time for one more. Just that. Um, in relation, oh, in, in relation to how these hubs are being used and the um, various um, organisations or companies that come in, is it? It's a you're encouraging them to use some of the um, digitised collections that might be available, is that part of the sort of, are you getting something back in return? Um, I suppose that's what I'm curious about um, and how, how might that relationship be developed after the period they might be in the hub? Yep. Um, well, in our case, we're not a collecting institution, <laughs> so we uh, don't focus on that, um, but we do think about ways that um, the museum can be a testing ground for some of these ideas. Um, so we've done several collaborations with the new museum store, um, with the membership department, uh, with the education department. Um, so we're plugging into the museum in various ways that are not necessarily related to the exhibitions uh, at the moment, um, although I th that's kind of the next area that I want to tackle. Yeah, ours is very explicitly using um, the museum space. Uh, people product test in the museum space. Uh, there have been some commissions that have come out in the last six six months. A commission, there was a VR, VR, VR commission, a lot of public programs and talk series. A whole bunch of ben benef benefits in terms of pro programming content and experiences. Um, but those are two-way exchanges of value. Um, one thing, again, being a museum of uh, interactive media and games and TV and film, 
you know, that sort of thing of if, if somebody comes and tests their video game or their VR, ex VR experience on a weekend in our public spaces, not only is that the business getting the learnings from that, the public's getting to see how those experiences are made and the challenge and how those processes, what firms are doing with that. So it's, it's, it's a pretty, for us, it's pretty clear about that exchange, which is, which is a unique selling point, I think, for our tenants too, that the tenants want to align with our brand and what we're about and the resources we have, the net networks we have, the connections we have, and it's, ex and, and it's a value exchange there. Uh, so for us it's the same in what I said previously, so having um, some of the teams be deployed into Papa is, is a tangible outcome, but not just into Papa, so we've been at, um, really worked hard to try to involve lots of other museums from um, New Zealand of different shapes and sizes so that the, the solutions that the teams are developing um, also account for, you know, right down to, to the Catherine Mansfield birthplace or the, uh, the Cricket Museum through to, to a wonderful medium-sized museums, not just a, a national museum. So, um, yeah, in terms of the ongoing relationship with the teams, for us, although we're not, uh, they won't be co-located with us, it's not a co-working situation, we will have, we aim to have an enduring relationship with those teams. So we, they will turn into our alumni, alumni of 2016. We'll continue to run a program of activities for them next year. And then when we bring in 2017 and they become alumni, our alumni grows bigger and bigger. So this is, this again, it's, it's, it's about growing a big ecosystem. I think we need to get Julia down on stage. Oh, no, there's is tea it? first. Oh, there's yeah. tea, okay. Yeah, yeah, tea yes, then. of course. Yeah. Tea. Um, thank you, Julia, Seb, and Tui. That was really informative. Great panel. So.